Holy Father in heaven above, I'm so thankful. You've given us an opportunity to study your word together. I want to pray for your help. That everything that I'll speak will not be my words, but you will be able to explain the truths for this time for yourself, to your people. That you may not trust me to leave me alone to explain these things, but rather, Lord, as an angel was able to, able to deliver messages, will instruct your angels to touch my lips with calls of fire. But one more time, your truth may be understood by your people. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Okay, so we are uh, going to study on the subject Christ as man. Now, I know that this is a very sensitive study, and I'm asking for the grace of God to be able to take us through this study. And I'm asking that God, in his wisdom, will uh, help us to understand what it is that he's saying to us. So I'm trying to share my screen so that we could be able to study together and see what it is that God is saying to us. So uh, I'll try to get my phone to be something that you, you all are able to see and then we'll get started. Now, <clears throat> when Christ came down here on planet Earth as a human, we need to understand that he came to be a perfect example for us. And what does it mean for Christ to be a perfect example for us? We know that Christ, as the Son of God, is divine. And we know that when he came down here, divinity was not to exist separately from humanity, but rather they were to be perfectly blended together in an inseparable way. But we are told by inspiration that the divinity of Jesus Christ was to be veiled by his humanity or be clothed with this humanity. What that means is that there was no time in the life of Jesus Christ that his deity or his divinity infringed his human choices. There was no time that Christ tapped into his divinity to do anything whereby the body was compelled to do otherwise. What that means is Christ was a real man as you can be able to see if we put on the right glasses and study the book of Hebrews with an open mind. The book of Hebrews explains, like no other book in the Bible, I suppose, the humanity of Jesus Christ. In fact, if you want to understand Jesus Christ as a human being in the plan of salvation, you will be interested in studying the book of Hebrews. In manuscript 67, 1898, we are told the humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. When we study the humanity of Jesus Christ, we'll understand better the plan of salvation and know our part, for Christ came to be an example for us. It is the golden link chain which binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. Christ was a real man. So when we talk about Christ, we are talking about Christ as a real man. But don't you ever forget that in Jesus Christ was two natures perfectly blended together, a subject that you have found time to study on this platform, I believe, extensively. But we are not to forget that Christ was a real man. He was not a metaphorical son of man. Let me come over that again. There is the danger of making Christ a metaphorical son of God, but there is also the danger of making Christ a metaphorical son of man. What makes Christ a metaphorical son of man is where Christ is not a perfect example for every human being in this world. 
And inspiration continues to say, and he gave a proof of his humility in becoming a man. And he was God in the flesh. You'll be able to see a little bit more about that. Now, he was to stand between the sinner and the penalty of sin. Yet few would receive him as the son of God. He would leave his high position as the majesty of heaven and appear on earth and humble himself as man. And by his own experience, Christ was to become acquainted with the sorrows and temptations that human beings would have to endure again as man. All this would be necessary in order that he might be able to succor them that should be tempted. So why have I read that quote? It's simply because of the last, st last statement that says all these would be necessary in order that he, Christ, might be able to suck or to save them that should be tempted. Why did Christ accept humanity to veil divinity? It was for one basic objective or purpose that he, Christ, would be able to suck at them that should be tempted. If that did not happen, then he would not be in a position to suck at them who should be tempted. And so, Christ was our example in how many things? In all things. He was a perfect pattern in childhood, in youth, and in manhood. I want us to understand, in every stage of his life, he is a perfect example or pattern for us. Christ's childhood and youth was scarcely noticed in the Gospels. Rarely written about, however, he was brought up in a wicked Nazareth. The inhabitants were proverbial for their selfishness, avarice, fraud, deceit, and general wickedness. Christ did not make believe take human nature. And that's very important. He did not make believe take human nature. In other words, it was not a, a role play kind of thing. It was not metaphorically taking the nature of human being. Christ did not make believe take human nature. He did very little take it. What does that mean? Verily, in every specific sense of it, he took it. He did very little take it. He did in reality possess human nature. So Christ in reality did possess human nature. But our study today is not actually going to um, go deep into uh, explaining or giving, um, or rather uh, expounding if Christ had human nature or not. No, rather our study will be actually looking at some aspect of, <clears throat> some aspect of the attributes of God. Christ was a divine son of God. And so by the virtue of being a divine son of God, there are attributes of God that was in Christ. For example, the Bible says, as the father had life in himself, so gave he also to the son to have life in himself. So what happens there is the attributes of the father were in the son. For example, the father has attributes such as immortality. The father had attributes such as omnipresence. Uh, the father is omnipotent the father is omniscient and so these are some attributes that are only uh, possible for god himself to have and we are seeing christ being a divine son of god and by accepting or taking uh, receiving a life from his father he would automatically have these attributes but now we are looking at Christ as the son of man. If Christ as the son of man possessed these attributes, we understand that Christ, yes, he did possess these attributes because we've already explained that inspiration is, is clear. Divinity and humanity were perfectly blended together in an inseparable way. But the question we beg to answer today that in the plan of salvation, as Christ lived on this earth as a man, did he tap into these qualities or these attributes to uh, live out his life daily, battling sin and having victory over sin daily? This is the thing that we need to find out today. Did Christ in his human nature, Christ as a man living through the 33 years, use his attribute of omnipresence that he had with the Father, 
omnipotent, which he had, and also the attribute of omniscience. For reason, we know that if he is truly the divine son of God, then having received the life from the Father, he received also these things. And so the question is, as a human being, did he use this omni attributes or character traits uh, to be able to live out his life daily? This is what you're trying to study. Christ did not make believe to take human nature. He did very little hack it. He did, in reality, possess a human nature. That's very interesting. So let's continue. He brought into his human nature all the life-giving energies that human beings will need and must receive. What did Christ do? As a human being, Christ brought into um, his human nature all the life-giving energies that human nature or human beings will need and must receive. The question should be asked, if Christ brought into his human nature something that me and you could not receive, could he be an example? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. If Christ brought into his human nature something more than what I can be able to receive in order to have victory over sin, could he be my perfect example and could I follow his example? That's the question. So we are told that Christ brought into his human nature all the life-giving energies, only that which human beings will need and must receive. So if I look at Christ, everything that he brought into his life, I can bring into my life. So if I suggest something that Christ brought into his life, either to work a miracle or to overcome sin or to do something in his life that I cannot bring, then I am actually subscribing to what now Sister White says is it's not Christ make believing a human nature. Make believing a human nature means it's not in reality. It's not in every sense. He was not a real man. It's not like me because he has tapped into something that I cannot tap into. And then what happens is he's used it to transact his daily businesses or he's used it to transact his experience of having victory over sin. And me as a human being, I cannot be able to tap into that. But then the spirit of prophecy says otherwise that he brought only into his human nature all the life-giving energies that human beings will need and must receive. Wondrous combination of man and God. And so... What I want, to, I want us to understand is it was very difficult for Christ to remain human. What I mean by that is because Christ was a true son of God. He was divine. And him being divine, it was not easy for him to remain a human. What I mean by that is the greatest temptation that Jesus Christ received daily was to remain human while he was at the same time a true divine son of God. The greatest temptation that he received in his life was to continually suppress the attempt of divinity to take over, being that it was the son of God. And we'll be able to see that briefly in the temptation of Jesus Christ. It was as hard for Jesus Christ to remain a human as it was as hard for us to remain in the eye and lifted profile of divinity combined with humanity where we cannot sin, the very nature of, of Christ and his Father. As difficult as it is for us to attain and remain there, so was it difficult for Christ to remain human because he was a true son of God. Okay, so when you continue studying, you realize, and I'll bring into an aspect the ministry of angels, because if the many of our believers understood the ministry of angels, they would, be, uh, they would be saved from a lot of deception that is right now, uh, 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 that is right now flying, um, uh, um, uh, uh, right, right now is flying amongst many people who have currently come to the message of the Father and the Son. Now, in the life of Jesus Christ, he needed the ministration of angels. Why do I say needed the ministration of angels? Because the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, Christ was created a little lower than the angels. Uh, and you say, no, no, you said Christ was created, yes. I mean the human nature of Christ. That's what I mean, because the, 
Christ as the Son of God before incarnation was not created. He was begotten in the express image of the Father's person. But Christ born of Mary, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, a body as thou created me. Now you need to understand that. And so I would be right to say that Christ coming into this world was not given an exalted position above the uh, like that of the angels above the angels but he came lower even lower than the angels to our very own level so that he could become one of our own brothers so if christ need if we need the ministration of angels christ definitely needed the ministration of angels and we need to understand that look at what it said in matthew chapter 4 verses number 10 uh, then it Jesus Christ unto him, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only thou shalt serve. So this is the temptation that comes to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ meets that temptation, rather, with the word of God. And in verse 11 says, The devil liveth in, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So what happens is, the devil disappeared from Christ, and then angels ministered unto him. Christ used the word of God, and then we see also the ministration of angels closely linked to that. The importance of the word of God and the importance of angels in the plan of salvation is not questionable. It is a solid truth. And you can... be able to see now, as I read down here, the angels now minister to the Son of God food. Christ should be angry, comforted with the messages of his Father's love and assurance, and the Bible says of assurance that all heaven triumphed in his victory. So you can be able to see that he was strengthened, he Christ was strengthened with food, comforted with the messages of his Father's love and the assurance that all heaven triumphed in his victory. Warming to uh, life again, art goes out in sympathy for man until the foe is vanquished and our fallen race is redeemed. It's out of Ages 131, paragraph 1. Let's continue a little bit. It says, the arch deceiver ought, listen carefully, that under the force of despondency and extreme anger, Christ could lose faith in his word, in his father. So Christ had faith in his father. Just like you and me need to have faith in the Father. In the temptation of Christ, in the temptation of Christ, Christ did not overcome of his own self because he was a divine son of God. No, he did not overcome because he was a divine son of God. He did not overcome the devil because he was omnipotent or because he possessed the attribute of omnipotence, being the son of God, a divine person. No. Christ overcame because he had faith in God. Every Christian will overcome because he has faith in the Father and his only begotten Son. So he says Christ would not lose faith in his Father, work a miracle in his own behalf. So if he lost faith in his Father, what would he do? He would act a miracle on his own behalf and make himself and take himself out of his Father's hands. So you could be able to see that. Because if we do anything of ourselves, then we actually take ourselves out of the Father's hand. We cannot do anything of ourselves. In fact, the Bible says in 5 and verse 30, I think that is in the book of uh, John chapter 5, verse 30, Christ says that I can do nothing of my own self. So Christ could not do anything of his own self. I can do nothing of my own self. So Christ depended only on the Father to do everything because he could do nothing. So to do something, he needed to have faith in the Father. Because he says, I can do nothing of my own self. Means he could do something. So what happens is, if he did that, he would take himself out of his father. The plan of salvation would have been broken. Now, I want you to see that. If Christ in any place had used his attribute of being all-powerful, so that he said, you know, I can work a miracle to actually save myself out of this time. 
then he would have broken the whole plan of redemption. I want you to see that carefully. He would have broken the whole plan of redemption. Let me go over that quote again. The act receiver hope that under the force of despondency and extreme anger, Christ would lose faith in his father. So he had faith in his father. Work a miracle in his own behalf and take himself out of his father's hands. Had he done this, the plan of salvation would be broken for it was contrary all on his own behalf. Christ was never to act a miracle on his own behalf, never. So all the miracles that Christ ever performed were not performed by him. Rather, were performed by God through the ministry of angels. Every miracle, it was performed by God through the miracles of, through, 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 the, through the ministration of angels, saying like, what do you mean really, Zadok? Let me show you something a little bit, and really quickly, from, I want to just look at it from, uh, the book of uh, the book of Acts. Look at the book of Acts. If 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 you would, uh, the book of Acts, and we are going to the book of Acts, chapter number two, chapter number two. There, look at verse twenty-two. Acts chapter number two, verse twenty-two. Did Christ Himself act any miracle of His own self? Then Peter says, look at what Peter says. Acts chapter number two. And from verses number 22, this is what the Bible says. The Bible says, uh, in that book, thank you, uh, it says, Ye men of Israel, hear this word, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you. So it was God who did those miracles by Jesus Christ. It was a vessel. Just the same way God did miracles by different apostles. He did miracles through John and Peter. To raise, or rather to, to be able to heal a man, uh, um, rather, who would not be able to do miracles through Paul including the miracle of raising the man Eutychus was dead. So the same way we realize Christ did not do miracles of his own self. He was actually a vessel used by God, the same way God can be able to use me. And we'll be able to see this as we continue studying through the word of God. Let's go back to our, to our study and see what the word of God um, continues to say. So this is what it says here. Uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 42 says, saying, Father, if thou wilt be willing, remove this cup from me. Whom did he depend on? He depended on the Father's willingness. Just like you and me depends on the Father's willingness. Our omnipotent power is all-powerful nature, which was actually veiled by humanity. He would not be an example for us. The atonement would not be fit to be accepted of heaven. And even the act deceiver would not accept the sacrifice. If anything, the Bible says God cannot be And so Christ had to be truly humanity would be inseparable, genuinely and persistently suppressed. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. Whose will was done in the life of Christ. It was not his will, it was the will of his father. Luke chapter 22, verse 43. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. The moment he surrendered to the will of God, an angel appeared. The moment you and me surrender to the will of God, an angel, ministration of angel will come and strengthen us in this work of life. That's beautiful for me, they say. It says, they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the bar of the hill, the city uh, where the city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. Verse 29. But Jesus was protected in his mission by the heavenly angels. Who protected Jesus? 
it was not because Jesus Christ was so powerful that no one could actually hold him in check. No, no, no. And that's the same way we could be able to see Christ and we'd be able to see a, a story of uh, angels protecting James White. It, it's possible to us. And it's not because we possess the omni powers. It's because God through his son, through his angels, is ministering to us. And we'll be able to see that in the ministration of angels and ministration of the Holy Spirit. Passing through the midst of them and observed, he went his way. Is it true that maybe Christ became some kind of vapor? That's not true. But you could remember that angels, even in the time of Lord, were able to blind the men of Sodom. So angels had power. They are omnipotent beings, the spirit of prophecies. And directed by God, they would be able to lead Jesus Christ safely through that mob all the way out without them seeing Jesus Christ. And we could be able to see, it's not only Jesus Christ who had this experience. We remember the experience of Peter being rescued from the prison cell. It was the same experience. It's not because Peter possessed some supernatural, extraordinary powers, but because Peter had surrendered his life to the hands of Jehovah. And therefore, God could work a miracle through the ministry of angels. So what that means to me is if we understood the ministry of angels, then we'd understand a lot of things that are now becoming a tussle among us false and believers. Okay, so let's continue with studying. Remember the story of Peter, how an angel rescued him. He wasn't omnipotent, but we see him walk out from a jail miraculously. That's a wonderful plan of salvation will bear in that wonderful plan of salvation will bear investigation. All heaven is interested in this work. Up to the time when Christ died, though he was human, he was without sin. And he must bear his trials as a human being. Hallelujah. There was to be no miracle interposed for him. So no miracle was to be in the post for him. There had been miracles wrought for him as at the very time. I want you to see there had been miracles wrought for him as at that time they were going to cast him over the brow of the hill. So the miracle was wrought for him. Don't you ever be deceived that Christ walking through the mob showed that it was all powerful. No, the miracle was wrought for him. He's just like us. I can do all things through Christ that strengthened me. Christ could do all things through the Father, strengthening him. He depended wholly on the Father. So miracles have been wrought for men who have been followed by mobs. When an angel of the Lord would take their arms and protect the servants of God against the work of Satan. It happened to Christ, it can happen to us. Then it says, I knew something of this in my early experience. I know whereof I'm speaking. My husband, incident related of an angel walking by his side through, uh, by his side through a mob. So it also happened to the husband of Sister White, James White. And so it can also happen to us. What we are trying to explain today is Christ was divine, for divinity was combined with humanity in an inseparable way. But we must not forget that though divinity and humanity were perfectly blended together, Christ as a human being, as a man, never used his power of being omnipotent or that attribute of deity in order to overcome the mob. No. Christ as the Son of God, and now also as the Son of Man, did not use deity to infringe his human choices and his human actions. Never. When we see this, or when we say this, we are not denying the divinity of Jesus Christ while he was here on earth, except we are trying to show that while he was the divine Son of God, humanity veiling divinity, he did not use his divine powers, his omni powers, to do miracles or even to overcome sin or to transact his daily uh, duties. Now, someone will say, but there are quotes that say divinity flashed through humanity. We could find time to go through that. All can testify what God has wrought in these cases. Then just as these things will take place with us, they did with Christ. So everything, these things that took place with Christ, 
they will also take place in our lives. It's not because we have omni powers. It's because we've surrendered our will wholly to God. He wants to work no miracle for himself. We are not working a miracle for ourselves. But angels protected his life till the time he came, came when he was betrayed by one of his disciples, till he was to bleed out his life on Calvary's cross. Then he says, and Satan stirred up the minds of men to think that the angels of heaven were indifferent, but everyone was watching the, everyone was watching the contest with interest from the moment, uh, from the moment that Christ knelt in prayer on the, the sort of story of Gethsemane till he died on the cross and cried out, it is finished. The angels and all the universe of God looked on, on with the greatest interest. When those words were spoken, the plan was completed. The plan whereby Saturn's power should be limited and broken, and whereby Christ should find. Out. And when he rose from the dead, his triumph was complete. Saturn knew that the battle with him was lost. Now look at this: the Father's presence encircled Christ, and nothing befell him but that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. So. It was the Father's love that continually encycled Christ. Um, let's continue. Here was his source of comfort. What comforted Christ? Christ was not comforted because he had, he, he had the powers in himself, the, 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 the deity, uh, because of his deity. That's not what comforted him. He was comforted because of the Father's love that continually encycled him. Here was his source of comfort, and it is for us. He who is imbued with the spirit of Christ abides in Christ. The blow that is aimed at him falls upon the Savior who surrounds him with his presence. Whatever comes to him comes from Christ. He has no need to resist evil for Christ is his defense. Nothing can touch him except fall by our Lord's permission. And all things that are permitted work together for the good of them who love God and are called according to his purpose. Okay, let's continue seeing a little bit what God is saying. When Jesus was awakened to meet the storm, let's think about that. Christ was awakened to meet the storm. And people have told me, you see, Christ is all powerful, omnipotent. And then he raised his hand, he rose from his sleep and said, peace be still. That is something that no man can do. Only God can do it. And so people have said he was omnipotent. Yes, and that is true. And he used his omnipotent power, omnipotent, the power of omnipotence. Let's look, look at that a little bit. He says he was in perfect peace. Why was Christ in perfect peace? There was no trace of fear or word or look in, in word of look, for no fear was in his heart. But he rested not in the position of the almighty power. You need to understand that Christ rested not in the position of the almighty power. What is the position of the almighty power? All powerful. He rested not in the truth that it was all powerful. He rested not in the truth that he was omnipotent. He rested not in the truth that he was omni. He would be. Uh, he had the attribute of omnipresence. He rested not on the truth that he was all knowing. He already had the attribute of all knowing. It was not us, the master of the earth and sea and sky, that he opened. That he reposed in quiet. That power he had laid down. Wow, Christ had laid down that power. And that's interesting. He had suppressed it. He, he had it in heaven with his father. That's, that's beautiful. But no, when he came down here, he's, he laid it down. And he, he, he says, I can of my own self do nothing. John 5, 30. He trusted in the father's mind. It was in faith, faith in God's love and care that Jesus rested. And the power of that word, which steals the storm, was the power of God. Isn't that beautiful? So that we understand that when Christ actually brought that storm into calm and it was not disturbed, it was not because he, he was omnipresent, omniscient, omni. Important. No, not all these things. Not because it was immortal. Not because of these attributes, but because we are told he rested in the power of God. And that's very important for us to understand. Christ is a king. And this is not denying his divinity. This is placing 
Christ as a human being in his right position so that he can be a perfect example for us. As Jesus rested by faith in the Father's care, so we are to rest in the care of the Savior. So it's the same, it's the same, it's the same procedure. It's the same way he did it that we have to do it. That's only when he can be omnipresent. I mean, that's only when he can be our true savior. Christ is a true savior. Any man who makes him a metaphorical son of man certainly makes him a false metaphorical savior. And you'll really be able to see this in a little while, what that really means. Um, the angels of God are ever passing from earth to heaven, from heaven to earth. The miracles of Christ for the afflicted and suffering were wrought by the power of God through the ministry of angels. Oh, I wish that our believers understood the ministry of angels because if they understood the ministry of angels, they would understand the plan of salvation. I'm not saying that the plan of salvation can only be understood by only understanding the ministry of angels, but I think it has been neglected. And so, by it being neglected, by many of us not studying it diligently, we have a false or a skewed view in regard to understanding how the plan of salvation is being acted on this planet or how it was acted in the time of Jesus Christ for 33 and a half years on this planet. The miracles of Christ for the afflicted and suffering were wrought by the power of God through the ministration of angels. They were not acted by the fact that Christ was an all-powerful person. We're still looking at the omnipotent aspect or view or an attribute of Christ. We believe he had that attribute, but I do not think the Bible teaches that he used that attribute to do miracles or transact any of the activities in his life during his youth, his childhood, his youth, and his manhood. That's what I'm saying. All those miracles were done by the Father through the ministration of angels, and we've been able to see a couple of and it is through Christ, by the ministration of heavenly medicine, that every blessing comes from God to us. This is why I say, if we understand this right, we can understand that we will be able to work miracles through the ministration of angels. Because it's the same procedure how it happened in the life of Jesus Christ that happened in our lives. In taking upon himself humanity, our Savior unites the interests of those who, those of the fallen sons and daughters of Adam, while through his divinity, he grasps the throne of God. And thus, Christ is the medium of communication of man with God and of God with man. Let's continue. The angels of God are hovering up and down from earth and heaven and heaven and heaven to earth. All miracles of Christ, how many of them? All miracles of Christ were performed for the afflicted and the suffering were by the power of God through the ministry of angels. All miracles, all miracles of Christ. And if we understand that, Okay, let's continue studying the word of God together. Take, for example, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Therefore, doth my father love me, John chapter 10, verse 17. Why? Because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. So, people say Christ was able to take up that life by himself. You know, the Trinitarians have claimed that way, that that shows the deity of Jesus Christ. That shows that he's God, and that shows that he's co-eternal with the Father, and all those claims that they have made. However, we who have believed in the Father, Son, truth, have explained that verse right. We know that Christ was raised by angels. That is just the same way we are to interpret other texts that are in regard to him doing other miracles that would suggest somehow that he did it of his own power, being that he was a divine son of God. How did he take it up again? Answer, the father resurrected Christ to the ministry of angels, Jesus whom God hath raised, whereof we all are witnesses. So we could be able to see that actually the father is the one who resurrected Jesus Christ, but the language as appears in John is Christ laid down his life of himself and took it up of himself. But that, that would be tricky. That would be tricky because then we would have, again, a metaphorical death. But the truth of the matter is, it was a real death. And being a real death, we can rightly say that Christ could only be resurrected by the Father through the ministry of angels, as also those who are faithful will be resurrected of the Father, Christ, through the ministry of angels. It says, uh, Jesus Christ laid off 
is royal robe, is kingly crown, and clothe his divinity with humanity <clears throat> in order to become a substitute and surety of humanity. That dying in humanity, he might by his death destroy him who had the power of death. He could not have done this as God, but by becoming as man, Christ to die. So if he did not suppress, if he did not surrender himself to the Father who had given him everything, so that the Father who had given him everything could have control over everything in his life, he could not have been able to be a fit sacrifice for us. That is why the Bible says that let this mind be you which was in Jesus Christ. Why? He humbled himself. Christ counted it not robbery to be equal with me. He was equally the Father, but he counted it not robbery. Now Christ gave up all things and took up the nature of man to be a real man, be an example of man. Let's look at all presence and see if Christ actually. Again, we say, we believe that Christ was fully divine and that divinity was veiled in humanity. But let's see if Christ was able to use the attribute of God or deity being omnipresent. And we understand that because we've taught that. Omnipresence, of course, through omniscience or through the spirit or the Holy Spirit. That's important for us to understand. But then let's look at what happens. You could read that more from the book Pago by James White, which will explain to you the omnipresence of the Father, uh, as is understood uh, uh, from the book of Psalms chapter 139. But now let's see if this attribute was tapped in by Christ, being a divine son of God. Come by with humanity, we are told. Come by with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. You, you, you got that? Christ cumbered, covered, veiled with humanity. Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was altogether for the advantage that he should leave them, go to his Father, and send the Holy Spirit to be his successor on earth. What happens is Christ cumbered with humanity. And the veil of humanity, as a human being, Christ could not be in every place at the same time, personally. It was therefore very important, and that's why he prayed that, Father, glorify thou me with the glory which I had with you, so that he could have perfect and complete control over the angels, so that he could be able to command the angels to go whithersoever he desired them to go, so that his very life could be communicated to this world, so that he could be able to have power and authority which had been given him. But now being a man, we understand that something has just happened to him. He has humbled himself. The delegated authority, the delegated power, all of these things Christ is willing to surrender to the Father so that he could be an example for us in order that he may save us. But then now he says, as we continue, uh, the Holy Spirit is himself divested of personality of humanity and independent thereof. He would present himself as present in all places by his Holy Spirit as the omnipresent. And we know how that actually comes to us. For the Bible is very clear to us in a couple number of texts. Uh, the Bible is very clear for us. For example, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which the Father gave unto him, and he was able to give to John through the ministry of angels. And so we understand that even the gift of the Holy Spirit is brought to us through the ministry of angels. So when we understand the ministry of angels, we'll also be able to understand angels as the eyes of God. And we'll be able to understand better what it means by the seven spirits that actually go forth from the throne of God to all the corners of the earth, that I understand as the ministry of angels. And so when you look at it that way, you'll understand that Christ cumbered with humanity could not be everywhere present. And so Christ as a human being did not tap into that attribute of God. Only God can be omnipresent, but God, but Christ did not tap into that attribute. Why? Because he was a true and a real 
man. Let's look at omniscience, because I can see my time really running out. Omniscience is an exclusive attribute of God. It is God having the ability to know the future before it comes, and the ability of God to know basically everything at any place at the same time. And so what happens is, this is of course an exclusive um, attribute of God, but we need to ask ourselves certain things, or some have suggested, but Christ was omniscient because, and exercised his omniscient powers, because Christ was able to see Nathaniel before Nathaniel was able to come to him. And we'll be able to look at that in a little bit. He as a human being did not know the day of his coming. We cannot say that today Christ does not know the day of his coming. Okay, I suggest if you have any reference as to the truth that right now he does not know the day of his coming, I would be glad to know. But the Bible says, but of that day and of that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. These are the words of Christ. And he's saying of that day, the Son does not know. The angels do not know, but the Father himself knoweth. And so you can be able to see that he was being just a true human being, while at the same time he was a divine Son of God because he had completely surrendered. And so humanity had been able to suppress or to veil divinity. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 says, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him. Who gave him those revelations? God gave the revelations to Jesus Christ to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. God gave him the revelation of the things which must shortly come to pass and sent and signified it by an angel unto his servant John, the prophet. Jesus saw Nathaniel. Jesus said unto him, Behold, an Israel indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathaniel said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. So remember, Jesus is saying to Nathaniel, I saw thee. How is it that Jesus was able to see him when you have already everywhere present personally? So he could see Jesus Christ is God and therefore. He is all knowing. But I don't think that's the case. Let's be able to see Nathaniel answered and said unto him, and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God, thou art the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? So it's kind of interesting because what Jesus is telling him is because I think he believed because I have just said it to you, I saw you under the fig tree. And you're like, okay. Who is he that can be able to see me at the fig tree who is not come to the fig tree? Okay, so thou shalt see greater things than these. There will be greater miracles than what you've just seen. And he said unto him, Verily I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see of heaven open, and angels of God ascending and descending, ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Why is it that Jesus has tied the question, or rather the issue, that Nathaniel has stated is the son of God, and he has said, because I said unto you that I saw you under the fig tree, therefore you believe that I'm the son of God. And then Christ tied, ties that aspect with the fact that you shall see greater things than this. And I say unto you, hereafter you shall see heaven opened and angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. I believe with all my heart that there's a reason why Christ has tied that experience with Nathaniel seeing angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. There must be something interesting that Nathaniel must need to understand about the ministry of angels in the life of Christ and in the life of every man. So let's continue to study. We see here that Christ saw Nathaniel before Nathaniel saw Christ. So it is now. Christ sees his children before they see him. 
He calls them before they answer him. He asks them in his mind before they notice Jesus. You need to understand that. How cheerful it is to realize that we have a sympathizing redeemer who identifies his interest with those of the suffering humanity. And he continues to say, you may consider him as your physician. He will and does give you grace. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He will carry you from grace to grace. You will need not be anxious. Simply rely upon Jesus Christ, your righteousness, and your own Nathaniel praying. And then it says, answer his prayer. Okay. So Jesus' divine eye saw Nathaniel praying and answered his prayer. Is that what I read? Yes. So someone would say, but you can see there, Jesus Christ has just tapped into his divinity to be able to answer uh, to the prayer of Nathaniel. Let's continue to see how prayers are actually answered because Christ is a true man. The angels of God are sending, bearing the prayers of the needy and distressed to the Father and the, uh, and, uh, above. And descending, this is the same thing that Jesus told Nathaniel, bearing the blessings and hope courage and help and life to the children of man. Who are the people who carry prayers and bring answers to prayers? These are angels. This is what happens in our lives. Is, is it possible that Christ is a human being if he relied on the Father would receive of the same blessing of the ministration of angels? Certainly, yes. Is it a mass that Christ had while he surrendered his life to Jesus Christ to tap into, into his divinity to be able to actually see Nathaniel, we'll be able to see in a little while. When Daniel prayed fervently, an angel was sent to answer his prayer. It is the angels who bear our prayers to heaven and bring back God's answers. But someone might ask, can angels read the mind when we pray secretly? Because Nathaniel was praying secretly. The answer is yes, but they are also given what I have called here delegated omniscience. Like Peter was given to read the minds of Ananias and Sapphira, God only has inherent omniscience, which is given to his son, of course. He does not depend on any creation to know the future. Now, we need to understand that Ananias was able to read something that or rather, Peter was able to see something that Ananias and Sapphira had been able to do without being where they were doing that thing physically. Will we say that Peter did that because he was omniscient? Will we say that he tapped into his divinity in order to be able to know that? No. We have seen instances where Ellen White has been shown things which she did not see with her own eyes. We have seen cases where, as a prophet, she was actually shown places that she had not visited physically. Will we claim that? <clears throat> will we claim that, that she was able to do that only because of her divinity? Certainly, uh, because she was divine. Certainly not. We know she wasn't. But we know that angels were able to do what was their part in bringing revelations to her, because angels are able to ascend carrying the prayers of the saints and descend, bringing answers from God to the saints. This is a beautiful truth. This is just how Ananiah and Sapphira were able, their the, the, the story was able to be shown to Peter just a short while. We don't see every instance where Peter is continually being able to know everything everywhere without physically being there. No, we only have one instance where I believe Angels are being used to give revelations of an happening without the physical reach of Peter and as a dedicated servant of God. And for the sake of preserving the, those things to his servant Peter through the ministry of angels. I find that helpful. Let's look at it. But Ananias, but a certain man named Ana, uh, Ananias, with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. 
and kept back part of the prize, his wife also being private to eat, and wrote a certain part and laid it at the feet of the apostle. Nice. But Peter said, An Ananias, why at certain field thine art to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the prize of that land? And then he says, While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, what is not thine own? Or under thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Now listen. Did you forget that angels of God were in attendance and that their pure eyes were reading your thoughts, the intents and the purposes of your act, and taking cognizance of every act and delineating your true frivolous character? While you were engrossed with your small talk, to the clerk with whom you were fascinated because he flattered your vanity. Could you have stood before the looking glass, you would have seen the gestures, the whispering among these who are observing you and laughing because you are making such a foolish show. And so you could be able to see that actually angels would be able to read the mind. In fact, this is what you said. Angels were in attendance and that their pure eyes were reading your thoughts and the intents and the purposes of your heart and taking cognizance of every act. And that is the sense in which they take part in the investigative judgment. Angels have taken record. Our acts and conduct are lit. It's a reality that there are books in heaven and that, and that they are written by angels. And if we do believe that angels have taken records to heaven, how would it be that we doubt that angels can read our act because we also sin by thought or by act or by, of course, act or conduct or by words? That's important to think about. Okay, Revelation chapter 2, verses 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, these things say the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Now, the eyes of the Son of God are like the flames of fire. What does that mean? We also know that Hebrews chapter number one, verse seven says, the angels say, who maketh this angel spirit and his ministers a flame of fire? And we've also read quite a couple number of times through the Bible, you could study that the eyes of God are actually a phrase used to refer to angels in heaven. So what I see in this story is I am seeing that Christ himself had eyes like the flame of fire. And if you study that, and I've done a study it's on our website on the, uh, on the seven spirits, you realize that the seven spirits are the eyes of God. And you'll also be able to see that those seven spirits are not the Holy Spirit. No, because they are sent forth to, the seven, uh, to, the, uh, to all the corners of the world. They are angels according to the book of According to the book of Zechariah chapter 4, where he says that um, these are the anointed ones that stand before the Lord of the whole earth and are sent to and fro and to throughout the world. So that is very important for you to think about. So I do not think that him being able to see uh, Nathaniel means anything like he had tapped into his omniscient attributes as a divine son of God, rather. What I understand there is he was still a true man. And even as if we are faithful through dreams, have you not read in the book of, um, have you not read in which book is this? Uh, Micah? No, no, no. But uh, the Bible says that we will be able to receive dreams and see visions in the book of Joel chapter 2, from verses around 28 and so on. You'll be able to see that we'll have dreams and visions and all these things, God will bring revelations to us if we surrender our lives to God. He has done it in the past and to many, many people. And so we can be able to depend on God, just as Christ depended on God. Okay, how did Christ gain victory? Did Christ gain victory because he was divine? Certainly not. I have said a couple number of times, his deity did not in any way infringe his human choices. It was veiled and suppressed. Even though it flashed 
And I will explain to you just in a nutshell why divinity flashed through humanity. It was basically to prove that Christ was a divine son of God. It was not to prove that he used his divinity to do anything. Miracles, overcome sin, or even be able to see future events or see people before they would be able to appear to him. Certainly not. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be tied with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like us we are yet without sin. Christ was tempted in all points as we are tempted yet without sin. Why is he without sin? The Bible says there is one God and one mediator between man, that word man in Greek, anthropos, between man and God, the man, anthropos, Jesus Christ. That does not refer to male. It refers to the human family. He was a real man. And so what happens is, when you look at the book of Hebrews, which I believe is the most explicit and elaborate study on who Christ was as a man, you'll come to understand one thing, my friends. And what you'll come to understand is this, that Christ, we have not an high priest which cannot be tied to the feeling of our infirmities. Pause. Why an high priest? There was not a high priest who was not a man. If Christ never accepted to take humanity, he could never be an high priest. Never accepted humanity, he could never be tempted. If Christ never accepted humanity, he could never die. You need to see those truths as they are. He had to accept humanity to work out the plan of salvation. And remember the quote that we read first, he would bring into his human nature all life-giving powers that it's possible for man also to bring into his human nature. So Christ could not tap into his human nature, something that I cannot tap into and become my example. If he did miracles because he was simply the divine son of God, we then can only do miracles because we are the divine son of God. Or because we are divine, which is not the truth. We can too do miracles, not because we are divine, but because like Christ, the divine son of God, did not use his divinity, but as human beings surrendered his life, and all miracles were worked from the Father through the ministry of angels to him, and to him, so to the extent that some people thought it was him working the miracles. Just that, that, that's just how it will be with us. Oh, wow. And so, and so, Christ was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now, that's a, a way of comparing certain things or elements. And what I would understand by that is, if he was tempted in all points as we are, he must overcome in all points as we overcome. If he overcame because of his omnipotent power, then he is not going to overcome as we can overcome. Because we cannot overcome because we don't have that attribute inherent in us. So, uh, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crimes, so Christ was crying, tears unto him that was able to save him from death, was added in that he feared. Christ, with the crying and tears, prayed to the Father. We too have to pray. So if we say that Christ still tapped into these things but at the same time prayed, you see, you see, it's, it's making him, it's making the plan of salvation kind of metaphorical. While we would have wind from the era of accept of teaching that Jesus Christ is a metaphorical son of God, listen to me. We could be teaching that he's a metaphorical son of man and having a metaphorical salvation. Okay. But we understand that we are not reduced Christ into an altogether level of man. Why is that so? Because Christ had two natures which were combined together. Divinity and humanity were perfectly blended together, inseparable. But humanity, while he was on this earth, suppressed his divinity, veiled his divinity. He used only his humanity 
to transact in his daily life responsibility. So we may resist temptation and force Satan to depart from us. Jesus gained victory through submission and faith in God. If Christ's confidence in God could be taken, Satan knew that victory in the whole controversy would be his. He could overcome Jesus. He hoped that under the force of despondency and extreme anger, Christ would lose faith in his father uh -huh. and work a miracle on his behalf. What was Satan waiting for? Christ to work a miracle on his own behalf. What are many of us today teaching that there are certain miracles which Christ did simply because it was divine? This is what I was taught, even in high school. That these miracles, uh, he tapped into his divine power to do, but certainly not. What we see consistently from the word of God is had he done a miracle, uh, uh, Christ would, uh, uh, rather, he says, Christ would lose faith in his father and work a miracle in his own behalf. But what would happen if he did that? Had he done this, the plan of salvation would have been broken. How could Christ teach us? While he was in the lake, the lake is tempestuous, the storm is raging, and there we see Christ. Christ acting, standing up, and using his divine power to calm the storm. What example would he give to the disciples? What example would he give to me? Well, we see Paul also come in a ship that is wrecked with the Euroclider. Was it because Paul was omnipotent? Certainly not. We see also Paul able to see the end of the storm. Paul says, none of you shall lose their lives because an angel has revealed to him. Could we say Paul is omniscient? As a human being, Christ was also able to see these things in the same revelation. But let us not forget that he still was the divine son of God. But as a man, he was a perfect example for us. So that Paul can be in the shoes of Christ when he's headed to Rome and the ship is hit by tempest storms and all these things, Paul would turn to God and peace and comfort through ministry of angels would fill his heart and his soul. Angels would show him the end of all things and encourage him. And he would say unto them, stay on board, for none shall lose his life. This is a beautiful experience that Christ himself also was not at peace because he was divine, but he was at peace because he rested in by faith in the arms of the Father who was able to supply comfort. And the disciples learned to rest in the arms of the Father. All of them would have been at peace. But when he realized that the disciples were of little faith, he rose and he said, oh, ye of little faith. He didn't write and say, you know, you people can do nothing because you people aren't divine. He said, oh, you guys are of little faith. You cannot trust the Father strong enough, well enough. And then he said unto the, the, the peace be still. And we know all those miracles that Christ has done on behalf of Christ with the ministry of angels. Angels did their part. Same angels that hold the power into the earth says, here, he declares, the Lord God will help him. Who will help Christ? Jesus rested upon the wisdom and the strength of his heavenly Father. He declares, the Lord God will help him. Therefore, shall I not be confounded? And I know that he shall not be ashamed. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Pointing to his own example, he says to us. Pointing where? To his own example, he says to us, who is among you that feareth the Lord, that walketh in darkness, and hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord, and stay upon his God. Jesus endured agony, which required help. And support from his father. 
Christ is our example. And also, was he who knew no sin. He turned to his father. In the hours of distress, he came to the earth that he might provide a way whereby we could find grace. And what is grace? And the Holy Spirit and strength to help in every need. And he says, if, if the ministers of Christ will imitate this pattern, they will be imbued with his spirit and angels will minister unto them. Beautiful. Angels minister to Jesus Christ, yet their presence did not make his life one ease and freedom from severe conflict and fierce temptation. So if you understood pretty well the ministry of angels, all these things will be perfectly clear to us. But because we haven't understood them, we cannot be able to see how Christ actually uh, was able to overcome or do certain things while he was a young child, a babe in Jerusalem, uh, or rather in Nazareth, and while he was in his youth and while he was as a man old enough. What I want to say is Christ had two measures, divinity combined with divinity in the separate. Christ was not a lesser God. Christ was not a lesser human being. He was a real man. He was a real son of God, real divine son of God. But Christ in his daily transaction, in his daily life, in victory over sin, in performing miracles, in all this, in helping feed the 5,000 in charity work and all these things, in his generosity, Christ did not tap into his divinity. Christ only rested in the power of God. He did not use his omnipresence, presence, his omniscience, or even the attribute of his omnipotence. He rested on the power of God to do all these things. Christ fed the 5,000. We know that if we study that story very well, we'll see a beautiful explanation of the ministry of angels. And we'll be able to see that angels themselves were able to multiply that bread. And why am I saying so? It's because I feel, and you could be able to study for your own self, that angels who are able to make bread for Jesus Christ and supply him were able to continue multiplying that bread. How they made it, I don't want to speculate, but I think that it was possible for angels through in a miraculous way to continue supplying the bread to the great multitude that was seated down to receive the bread from Jesus Christ. I believe that Christ was a real man. And as a man, I believe Christ lived as a real man, not a metaphorical man. And I would just read that again as we end and open for questions and answers because that was, uh, it was beautiful. Um, a read as, just as we close so that it keeps you, it, it keeps you um, remembering the things that we've been discussing. Christ as a human being. Uh, I just want to read this and then we'll, we'll be able to bring this to a close. It's very important. Um, Christ did not make believe take human nature. He did very little take it. He did in reality possess human nature. That's very important. Christ did not make believe take human nature. I'll read again. He brought into his human nature all the life-giving energies that human beings will need and must receive. What did he bring into his human nature? If he was a real human, only those things human beings will need and must receive. Will we need omnipotence? Will we need omniscience? Will we need to be immortal? Will we need omnipresence? Certainly not. We cannot receive them. They're exclusive attributes of God. So while he possessed them, he did not bring into his human nature. Or if he brought them into his human nature to use them to show his divinity, would not be a perfect example of Christ. He brought into his human nature all the life-giving energies that human beings will need and must receive. What I will need and I must receive, wondrous combination of man and God. That summarizes for me what I understand 
about this subject. May God bless you and pray, and then we could be able to have questions and answers. So we'll spend time to pray and thank God for that opportunity, and then let's pray. Thank you, Father in heaven, for a good opportunity to be able to study what it is that you're saying to us. We could not have used the best language to explain what it is that you are saying to your people. But we are so thankful that angels are going to churches and explaining law to the churches what it is that you're saying to them. May angels continue to educate your people better. And may you use us even in a better way, Lord, to understand what it is that you're saying to us. This is our prayer by faith in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.